forward to the cloud. Cool. Okay. So welcome everyone to the 10th week of Open Life Science. This is another group cohort call where we will be talking about FAIR. Um, and we are really delighted to have you here. So I'm going to go through our standard housekeeping before we kick off with our amazing speakers and few group activities that we have. Um, so this call is recording. Please leave your camera off if you'd rather not be seen, but you're also very welcome to have the call on if you uh, don't mind having your face. Um, please try and keep the microphone muted if you are not talking at the minute. And you are very, very welcome to participate by unmuting when you have, whenever you have questions, uh, but this just helps prevent background noise coming through uh, by accident. Um, so OLS, Open Life Science, has a code of conduct. So as a general rule, we ask that people treat one another with the respect that you'd like to be treated with. Um, if at any point, um, and there is more to this, so it's always good to click through and have a look. There's a link to the code of conduct in our documents. But as a general rule, if you at any point witness or experience behavior that you think isn't in line with our code of conduct, you can report that by emailing team at openlifesci.org or emailing one of the Open Life Science members individually if you'd rather not get the whole team for some reason. Um, and the email addresses are also all in our notes documentation. And I will also ask everyone just very briefly to edit your Zoom name and just add a W or an S before the, before your name. Uh, the W indicates written. So when we go into breakout rooms, if you prefer to have a written breakout room, an S indicates spoken if you prefer to have a spoken breakout room. And just uh, indicating that with your uh, Zoom name allows us to quite quickly and easily sort you into the correct breakout rooms. Uh, because there will be one breakout towards the end of the call today. Um, we also have a live transcription on otter.ai. This is on the top left of the screen. This just allows you to follow along um, automatic captions of what's being said. Um, and it's also part of the reason we have the breakout rooms is just to make sure that everyone can participate fully and comfortably according to their preferences and abilities. Um, I think it is time to actually start kicking off this call. Um, I don't think I've missed anything. Emmy, do you want to introduce the next section? Definitely. Thank you so much, Yo. Um, yeah, today, as Yo mentioned, what is all about FAIR? FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So you see that being well discussed and um, hopefully applied in your projects as well uh, in we're going to discuss three areas today, uh, data, training, and software. So without further ado, um, if I could please hand over to Emma, who will talk about FAIR data. Hi, yeah. Um, can I share my screen or? Yeah, that would be perfect. OK, fantastic. And no. <laughs> now I've got to find the right. Here we go. No, I don't want to do that either. Sorry, I was very prepared and now I'm not prepared at all, apparently. Uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, yes, fair data. Okay, so uh, first of all, just very quickly, um, I'm uh, Dr. Emran Harris um, and uh, I've worked in uh, research integrity, research ethics, open science, uh, responsible research kind of area uh, for a number of years. And um, I used to give um, training workshops on, on open science, including uh, uh, data uh, for, for uh, several years of my last project. Um, so that's kind of how I'm here today. Uh, so I just want to quickly go through a few things. And I think I'm touching on a few things that um, my fellow speakers are going to talk about as well, um, such as training and software. So I'll, I'll I'll move on from those quite quickly because obviously I don't want to take up space uh, when you've got people who have more expertise. Um, but I'm very quickly just going to start with a, a fair data analogy that I use in training. Uh, this helps, I think, just get us moving from the, the abstract terms uh, to something a little bit more concrete. And also, if you are thinking of doing any trading yourselves, it's, it's a nice um, nice thing to use. Uh, then I'm going to talk about impediments and solutions. Um, so I didn't want to just kind of reiterate a lot of the information that's already out there, but maybe move the conversation a little bit forward in terms of kind of where we are now. Um, and instead, I mean, you could call it impediments and solutions or challenges and successes. 
and uh, then looking maybe at a little bit of fair guidelines of um, what we could kind of uh, do more of, um, what some some ways we could could manage fair data uh, could be. So just straight on with the, um, I don't know if you can see the last image, I'll just move this down. Uh, so the um, fair uh, data analogy. Um, so there's a YouTube link in the bottom right corner. You can watch me give the, the whole thing in detail. Um, or, and you're welcome, of course, if you do find it useful to embed it in any kind of online courses, uh, it's completely CC by. Um, um, but the way it works is I, um, when explaining it, I talk about data as treasure. So if you imagine you heard about some hidden treasure, you know, like, you know, a, a pirate thing or something. And um, first of all, you you'd need to be able to find the treasure. So you'd need a map, you know, you need to be able to find it. And then if you knew where it was, you need to be able to get to it. So are there shark infested waters? Are there bandits? Are there whatever? And then if you found the treasure chest, could you actually would you have the right key? It's no good if you've got, say, a Yale modern key and it's an old key or vice versa. So could you actually get get into the, the treasure chest? And then when if you got into the treasure chest, would the treasure be something, would it be crisp euro notes or dollar notes or would it be some weird old money with skulls on it, um, which is, is not very useful to anyone? Um, so yeah, I just use this analogy just to get uh, us thinking maybe in a, a slightly more um, dynamic way about what FAIR actually means, what the individual parts of the FAIR uh, acronym actually stand for. And I find this can be quite useful um, to make it a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more real. So yeah, that's just to kind of warm us up. And now um, some of the, the little bit more uh, policy side of things, a little bit more um, in depth. Uh, so impediments, or I, I guess you could also look at them as challenges. Um, uh, so the first one that I, I think needs mentioning is the inadequate storage um, and inadequate repositories for uh, large, sensitive, um, or discipline-specific data. So for instance, I know that the earth sciences um, often complain that they don't feel they have a repository that fully uh, meets their data requirements. Um, so, uh, because obviously that, that's got some quite specialist uh, requirements and uh, you want to be storing data in a very, um, in a very specific way and so generic repositories aren't, aren't really working. And um, so that's, you know, immediately you, you, you've, you've got to think about not just, when you're thinking about fair data, you're not just thinking about the fair principles, you're also the data part of that, fair data. Um, and in order to make data fair, uh, there needs to be um, sufficient technical um, support uh, for the variety of data that research data that's being produced. Um, you've also got things like very large data sets. When I was doing training, I'd often hear this from researchers saying, okay, but you know, I'm looking at terabytes upon terabytes of data and they simply there aren't repositories that can handle that um, and then sensitive data so you know as I said I worked on data uh, governance data ethics and you know you obviously I'm sure you're all aware can't just be putting personal or medical data in uh, at, you know Zenodo um, so balancing fair and ethical treatment of data is, you know, I could give an hour long presentation just on that, but obviously I just want to flag it up as something to think about um, when we're talking about fair data. Um, so moving, moving on, uh, discipline differences in output in, uh, and terms impacting interoperability. So interdisciplinary interoperability, try saying that when you're drunk, um, is, is, uh, is a big issue. So particularly, uh, with the social sciences and the humanities, you've got um, just different terms, different terminologies. Uh, you've got different attitudes to uh, persistent identifiers. So ORCID, I had my ORC ID um, up at the, the start, but that's um, not necessarily something that all disciplines are asking their researchers to do. Um, so that you have these, these gaps, if you like, in terms of findability um, and uh, yeah, different uh, levels of, of outputs and, and uh, you know, how things, how variables are coded. 
um, can really impact interoperability. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, interoperability is often somewhat forgotten. Um, it's probably the hardest of the FAIR data principles to get right. Uh, findable is often the most, um, the easiest, and it's the one people start with. Um, but, you know, interoperability is, is the most difficult to, to, to define, and it's the most difficult to put into practice. Um, so I think that's very much worth, worth flagging. Um, so those are kind of the, some technical challenges. Um, then you've also got um, some more, maybe you would call them social um, challenges. So as I'm sure um, the, uh, the wonderful organizers of, of Open Life Science will attest, there are plenty of solutions um, at a community level, um, but the, the sustainability of those solutions is, is often uh, difficult because the, the, you know, the funding isn't there. People are doing these things as side projects. Um, and uh, that is impacting the ability of fair data to be, just become data. Um, that's the goal, right? At the end, we want fair data to just be data. Um, and then the, the, the final thing is a lack of legal or licensing knowledge. And this obviously relates to the R of fair, reusable. Um, and uh, the link, if you, the hyperlink I've got in the slides leads to um, research by a colleague and friend of mine, um, that's not why I linked it, she's just very good. <laughs> um, but uh, she's done work on, on research on um, how the concerns about say GDPR and other um, uh, legal aspects of data reuse and sharing um, often hold researchers back from making their data fair, from making it findable and accessible um, because they, they, they're not sure how to navigate and there isn't enough first level support within universities about the legal issues. Um, and then you've got your classic fear of scooping, uh, which I think we're all kind of familiar with. Um, so yeah, uh, solutions or successes. So it has become more easy, uh, become easier and more normal to cite data and to create uh, uh, data as, as a publication. Um, it's definitely anecdotally, and also there is some evidence for this. I haven't uh, actually put a reference here because it's the the report I read is still under embargo. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it's the, the the most recent surveys are definitely showing that it is becoming normalised. Um, so support uh, from uh, repositories. Um, so you've got the core trust seal. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure how many are familiar with that, but essentially it's something that repositories can acquire to show that they are a reliable repository where you can put your data. But the core trust seal requirements map quite closely onto the fair data principles. Um, so in, 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 in getting the core trust seal, they are actually meeting fair requirements, which um, is obviously a, a, a big success and a big step forward. Then you've got things like virtual research environments. I've given an example run by the Quest Center, which is, is here in Berlin. Um, and uh, this is where um, research is, it's kind of what it, it sounds like. Um, probably some of you are far more familiar with it than I, but um, it's, you know, essentially a place, a virtual space where researchers can create, work on research together. This obviously is, is, is massively helpful towards FAIR uh, data because it's, um, all the data is being worked on together, sometimes interdisciplinarily. And um, the trouble with that though, there is a, a kind of downside, a danger of that, is that you end up with these VREs as silos. So um, that no one else who wasn't originally in the virtual research environment can then reuse that data. So that's the, the slight danger of that. Also the expectations and support by funders and institutions are changing. Um, and you know, data management plans, uh, which often involve some aspect of the FAIR principles, though not enough, are becoming very um, uh, normal and expected. Um, and institutions are moving somewhat towards having, you know, data training and open data ideas. So, what could be fairer? What could be more fair? I, I've mentioned software here, but I'm not going to to uh, say anything more on that because I know uh, one of my fellow speakers is, is going to talk at more detail uh, but just that you know while um, open source kind of led the way uh, in terms of openness generally uh, there are inconsistencies in terms of, of software being fair 
Uh, services, so this is this twofold. Um, first of all, you have, um, could services incorporate fair more? So if you imagine, say, a library giving data training, could those uh, services talk more about fairness uh, and, and helping researchers understand the fair principles, but also the, the, the service themselves, are they fair? So is the training recorded? Is it findable? Is it accessible? You know, can it be, uh, you know, can it be downloaded? Um, and, you know, my, and in terms of accessibility, we often mean uh, sort of technical accessibility, but also we should think about accessibility in terms of, um, of, of uh, disability. Um, and I noticed, you know, you're using the otter.ai transcript um, so that this, this, um, well, you know, this meeting today is, is more accessible. And I ran a, a podcast for several years on open science. And, you know, in, uh, to, you know, out of ignorance and um, just, I guess, just not, not yeah, ignorance, uh, we didn't often provide a transcript for that, which meant that people who had hearing disabilities couldn't access that information, which is, you know, um, is not, is not the right, it's not best practice, and it did limit the accessibility of that information. So uh, there's a project, um, if you click on the link, that is looking at fair assessment and, and how services and service providers can make that self-assessment on whether things are fair. Uh, and then finally, just uh, workflows, they could be more fair. Some things towards that, are, you know, obviously my, my experiment, uh, where you can kind of, it's a bit like an open notebook type thing, and then persistent identifiers um, obviously are, are helpful with seeing where people are um, and sharing that workflow. Very quickly, because uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm running low on time, um, the other side of this making things fairer, uh, compliance. So this is a, a checklist, um, you know, as to whether things um, have been fair. And this is really useful in just in terms of, you know, using it. Um, with your own projects, looking at whether you've you've made things fair. So if you're doing any training, it's 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 very useful. Uh, but obviously, you know, you, it could be used in a very soft way, like a, as a checklist, or it could be used by funders. You can imagine in a very kind of strict way, like have you done each of these things? If not, you're not going to get your money, sort of way. Um, and then metrics, I put and metrics question mark, and there's a, a report there. Um, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I do recommend you you take a look at that. Uh, obviously, I think we're all very wary of metrics, given where that's landed us in the publishing industry. Um, but fair metrics might be a way forward, and it's something that I think funders and people like the European Commission are, are going to be very keen on. Very policy-minded people are going to like that. Um, so it's something maybe to to have an idea about um, in general. Uh, so I've got some further reading links. They're also in the, the original uh, document. And uh, yeah, there's, there's links to contact me. Um, so I'll stop talking now. I'm not sure I am for time. I'll take any questions if there's time for that. If not, happy to, uh, you know, do that via writing. Thank you very much, Emma, for the very informative and um, insightful talk. Uh, folks, if you have any questions on fair data and what Emma's talked about for her, um, please put them in the Google Doc where towards the top of page five at the moment. And thank you for all your reactions during the um, talk as well. But you can keep putting your questions in the Zoom chat as well. I already see at least one question um, on the Google Docs. I'm just going to ask that one. Um, so Raina asks, uh, I'm interested in your take regarding further impediments specific for countries or communities in the global south versus the ones in the global north? Yeah, um, I, I, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I think anything that you can say about the impediments tends to be um, uh, exacerbated by the, the divide between the global north and the global south. I think a lot of technological solutions um, simply aren't reaching um, the Global South. Um, so we did an interview with um, a lady who's, uh, my name, I'm not good with names, um, but she she ran a training uh, thing in Kenya, um, uh, sort of a data training. And she was telling us on, this was on the podcast, she was telling us that, you know, they had a, a data and a software conference and to develop tools for the Global South. 
to help them have greater access to data and not a single this was held in madrid or something not a single person from the global south was invited to that conference so there's this this problem of uh people developing tools um that are either not intended for the global south or if they're even they are intended for the global south the people the researchers actually working there are not included in that conversation um so there's a technological issue um a gap and then uh you've also got the 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 bias uh where data and research from the global south is not given as enough uh, gravitas not given taken enough seriously enough by um the you know established academia um and there's there's that gap and that applies to publications and data um it's seen that data coming out of the global south is is less uh, robust perhaps um completely you know of course that's just a bias but i think that is very much an impediment to making data fair um because you know if you can't access the same things you that's an accessibility and a findability problem and if people aren't reusing that data you know that's again uh, a reusability and you know interoperability as well is a technological gap if the the same tools aren't available to everyone to all researchers then how can the data made available be interoperable thank you very much emma um yeah hope that answers the addresses the question a bit but if folks uh, especially with this global group um if you have other thoughts as well please feel free to chime in on the Google yeah Docs. yeah please someone who who knows more than me uh please please uh, say <laughs> say say more but that was just off the top of my head yeah. well, thank you for sharing um your knowledge and experience as well um in the interest of time i think we do have to move on unfortunately um but there is a question from michael as well on the google doc um emma if you could uh yeah address that in the doc that would be really great thank you of course and i hand over to berenice thanks amy uh, so um, it's my pleasure now to to start the discussion on fair trainings so for that i ask uh, alexandra olinsky she will give she's a scientific training officer at ember ebi um, and she will give a talk about uh, fair trainings and we already met several times with Alex, so I'm happy to that she talk about these these things. I was um, it's a, it's a topic I care about. So thank you, Alex, for giving this talk. Yeah, thank you, thank you for inviting me. So I will quickly um share my screen and let's see that everything works with this. Oops, not share. I also do this <laughs> present. So I hope everyone can see my screen now and can see my slides. So yeah, perfect. I see thumbs up. That's great. So um, yeah, again, thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Alex. Um, I work as a scientific training officer at Emily BI, so the European Bioinformatics Institute in the UK. Um, and as a scientific training officer, well, what do I do? I work together with scientific experts and bioinformaticians to um, develop, organize, and run bioinformatics training courses. I, um, I'm Training, as you see, I also I'm used to prepare training material. I also um, support others in um, preparing training material and sharing this. And yeah, this is why I'm here to talk about um, fair training now. Um, well, why should you um, actually care about sharing your training material? Sharing training material um, can have a lot of um, benefits and there are a lot of reasons for sharing it. For example, other people um, who will um, look for the training material online, they can use it as a so source for self-study and gain a lot of new knowledge from this. But not only for trainees, um, it can be beneficial, but also for trainers. They can um, use the training material they find online as a source of inspiration. They can even reuse the training material um, and um, edit um, it and um, build upon it, which can save them um, a lot of time and money. Um, but also trainers who put their training material online um, can um, get a lot of recognition, of course. So this all sounds great, but when we look for training material online, either as trainees because we need it um, for self-study or um, we are looking for something as a source of inspiration as in, the, in the role of a trainer, 
Um, we know that a lot of questions can occur. So for example, um, we might wonder, well, where can we actually find um, suitable training material? And if we have found it, um, we might wonder, when was it written? Is it still up to date or who wrote it? I still have more questions about the content. Can I contact anyone? Or um, another question might be, um, in which context was context was the training material presented. Um, and another important question is, can I actually um, reuse the training material, material? Am I legally allowed to do so? So you see that a lot of questions can pop up. And this is why it's so important if you're sharing from training material to do that in a fair way. So in a way that it is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Applying the fair principles of training materials provides a framework for enabling um, sharing and, about, and thereby helping trainers to make the most of the material, but also helping trainers to get um, trainees to get um, um, the, the most e efficient learning experience. So um, now how can we make training material fair? So there was um, a very um, great publication, um, which gives an overview of 10 simple rules for tracking making training materials fair. And in the following, I will now um, run um, through these um, um, 10 um, rules. And at the, um, in the very last minutes of my talk, I will also very quickly um, show you how we at Emble BI apply these guidelines to our training. So how can you make your training material more findable? Um, first, you have to describe it properly. And um, by doing so, or you should do so by annotating it um, with structured metadata, so with data which describes your material. And um, for example, Bioschemas um, is an initiative which facilitates the addition of metadata to um, life science resources. And this helps to make it more findable um, online. Um, you should also annotate it with keywords um, using um, um, structured controlled vocabularies. Um, and I will give a more concrete example of this um, at the very, or I will refer back to this at the very end of my talk. Also, you should give it a unique um, identifier. Attaching a persistent identifier to your training material um, makes it more easy to track online, but also will help you um, to be able um, or will make it citable. And um, you can also um, assign um, a persistent identifier um, to um, the author. Um, and we have already heard about the ORCID. Um, which um, simply helps to identify um, the, the author unambiguously online. Um, of course, you should also um, add your training material to an online repository so that other people know that it exists. And these repositories can be institutional ones, but they can also be open ones. This can be general ones or more, more field specific ones. We have already heard some, for example, um, Synodo, which is a more general one. And um, in the bioinformatics field, we, for example, have Elixir Tess. Elixir Tess is a life science training portal where you can find a lot of um, bioinformatics and life science training material. Well, how to make your training material more accessible? by um, um, making it findable in a repository and assigning um, a persistent identifier to it. You already are nearer um, to, to the step to, to make it more accessible for others. But then the accessibility of training material can um, vary for different reasons. There might be material um, which is um, more restricted, where the access is more restricted because it's, for example, only accessible for specific members of a university or payment might be required or the training material can be completely open. It's always very important to clearly um, state, clearly define how people can access the material and even um, maybe also do this in plain English so that there is absolutely no confusion of um, how people um, can access it so that it will be simply more um, be more accessible by being transparent about this. Well, how can you make your training material more interoperable? Um, when you share training material, you should always keep in mind that other people um, might um, want to reuse it, might to edit it, might want to build upon it. Um, and um, you, you also have to consider that other people might want to use your training material across different computational systems or might even want to use it offline. So you have to balance um, very carefully which frameworks you want to take for your training material. For example, if you give a presentation and um, you think about presenting it um, in, in a PowerPoint format, well, this is always very helpful um, if um, because people or trainers um, can um, edit this very easily and can build upon it. Um, in, if you, for, for example, compare this with a PDF format, which is not so easily editable. But then a PDF format is, of course, much more easily um, usable across different computational systems. So you have to um, carefully um, yeah, consider this when you deliver training. 
Um, well, how can you make your training um, um, even more reusable? It's very important that you assign a license um, to your training material. So this will allow other people um, to know if they are allowed to reuse it and how they are allowed to reuse it, and also tell them how your material should be cited when they reuse it. Also add um, more metadata to describe the context of the material and thus help the trainers um, to get more information about your material. This should, for example, include when was the material written and who wrote it, um, where was it presented, in what context, um, what was the, uh, the target audi audience of the event and what were the le learning outcomes of um, this event. Also keep your training material up to date and clearly state um, when it was last updated and also welcome contributions. So encourage others um, to provide feedback and contribute to the further development of your material. So I have given you now a lot of um, guidelines um, in theory and in the following um, last um, few minutes, I would very quickly like to show you how we apply these guidelines um, for our um, training that we deliver um, or that we provide at MBI. So um, first, um, we, um, as I've already told you, we um, offer bioinformatics training, and our training um, does comprise um, live um, training courses, which are face-to-face -face courses, not at the moment, of course, um, but also virtual courses and live webinars. And we also have on-demand training, so online training like online tutorials, recorded webinars, and course materials. And you can access and find every um, all of our training offer on our course web page. We um, um, in the following hour, very quick, uh, very more um, refer to the online tutorials we have. So we describe all our online materials properly by, um, for example, using edermontology. So edermontology is a set of controlled vocabularies, um, which describes concepts which are very common in bioinformatics and computational and biology. We also link the MBDI resources, so the databases that are covered in the training um, tutorials um, to, um, the, to the tutorials. And we also describe them um, using um, extra terms and keywords which describe the topics of the tutorials. By this, um, we aid the search and the search out to complete function on our web page. We also give unique identifiers to our tutorials. For example, you can see here that we um, have a DUI and with um, this digital object identifier, we make um, this tutorial citable by others. And also our authors, they have um, orchids assigned to them. So they are also um, unambiguously identifiable. We also make our material reusable. We um, have um, um, licenses assigned to our material. We, for example, um, use a CC BY SA license, which um, allows for other people to use our material, to transform it and rebuild on it. Um, but they should give us credit and also share it under the same license again. Um, we also keep our training material up to date. We keep it up to date or we review it um, once a year and um, we clearly state um, on the page, on the web page, um, when it was last updated. What is now not shown here is um, that we also ask um, our trainees for feedback. So we have um, standard feedback forms where we really encourage people to let us know um, what they think about our training material and to give us um, helpful feedback so that we can revise it um, regularly. So all in all, I should say, um, this is all work in progress. So um, we still can make um, our training um, much more fairer. And this is a long process to really um, make it very fair. And um, for example, we are working on adding um, further metadata tags um, to our material and also expanding the downloadable materials, just um, to name um, a few examples. With this, um, I'm at the end. I've also um, provided um, some more helpful resources. Um, I have included the paper here to the 10 simple rules. And then there are also two webinars where you can, um, which you can watch where you can find more information. And I will also add them to the, to the living document, um, which is provided. So if we have time for questions and if there should be any questions, I'm happy to receive them. And otherwise you can always, of course, also con contact me um, through my email address or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex, for the talk. Um, it, so I saw one question in the Google Doc. If you have any other question, please uh, put them in the Google Doc or in the chat. But I will ask you the question in the Google Doc. So can we think about our fairness of project documentation in the same line as training? Or are there specific considerations for training that, doesn't, that do not apply to other type of documentation? What is your thought about that? So 
I think what is very um, important about um, training is um, one of the informations that I uh, mentioned is that you should, for example, um, state the target audience, um, which um, I'm not sure when you talk about general documentation, this can be everything. There might also be a certain group you want to direct um, the, the, the general um, documentation to, but this is very, very important in training to really let people know um, who um, this was addressed um, to and also the learning outcomes. So what um, did, could they learn um, when or what can they learn by, by going um, through this material. I think this is not normally um, the case in, in, in general um, um, documentation. So these are, are two um, aspects which should, should certainly not um, be missing um, when you um, develop training material. Yeah, the metadata and annotations of the materials and are more details in trainings, you would say, than in documentation. So, okay. Um, anyone have any further questions for Alex? Actually, I do. I was typing, but I'm too slow with typing. Um, I keep thinking about diversity and inclusion efforts that are now pursued by different societies, you know, whether it is your, your discipline specific society or um, a hospital or just any any kind of party. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean, FAIR is, we're talking about it in the context of data. But is this something that can also be moved into the diversity and inclusion space? And, and what would that be like? You know, are we talking about um, DI trainings um, being, being, being openly accessible or, or, or things like that? I mean, I, I don't know. I find, I find it very, very inspiring to think about it. And I think it should have a place, but I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm fully grasping the translation here. I think that's a very interesting and important question. So, because I think this was also mentioned a bit before by Emma, when we talk about accessibility, to really make it um, accessible for for um, different um, different people, and I, I I would yeah I would like to to see this um, link of of seeing or interpreting um, the, the A in in, in fair um, um, to make it really more accessible to to everyone, and maybe this needs a bit more um, yeah um, um, here. In my talk, I, I did not really um, refer to this um, in much detail. That's true, um, but I think um, there should certainly be a link. And if this answers your question, or if this um, is what you were referring, I mean, there were so many aspects of it, and um, I mean, whether you know, I think I think the training part in diversity and inclusion is is so big, and um, I think. There, I, I'm seeing many parallel efforts happening where a specific training is being developed for party A and then party B thinks about a similar training, whether it's microaggression workshop or um, things like that. And just like, if it, it, it really feels like this could be one effort, like maybe maybe a blueprint or, or, or something that, that then can be, um, applied and modified to the needs of, 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 of the various parties. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a really good um, thought. Yeah. Any further questions? Uh, uh, any, thanks for, I mean, thanks Fabian for your question. Um, any further question for Alex? Otherwise I think we are already quite good in time. So I think I will end in to Malvika to you continue then. Thanks Bernice and thanks Emma and Alex for the very thought provoking presentation. And I'm really enjoying the discussion and the direction it's going towards. So what I will ask you to do is to take next five to six minutes to spend some time in understanding how you apply one of the four FAIR principles. So think about, um, what will you have to do to make your project more either uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable? Just choose one because six minutes is probably not enough. Um, and write down your notes. This would be notes for you, but we want to have this shared reflection so that you can look at what others are thinking towards and if you can apply it, apply that into your own project too. Uh, thanks. You, it's on the top of page number eight. You can choose one principle.
just going to say, say if you can't access the Google Doc, please use the chat and I can move your comment into the notes. So you can also use the chat to uh, drop your personal reflection. The last 60 seconds warning uh, if you want to wrap up what you're writing.
Okay, I'm just gonna go through a few of the notes that you've written, uh, but do raise your hand if you would like to share what you wrote with the rest of the team. Um, just starting with you writing about the OLS to make more findable, uh, where, for example, we have captioning of the calls, but we have to also correct them in order to make sure that we are not perpetuating the mistake that uh, occurs in Otter and uh, updated on YouTube, along with the notes and syllabus. I have just like captured a few examples from what you were writing. Uh, I think one very legit worry is about how can you communicate fair principles with the collaborators who are not as open to sharing their data, um, which is something that we need to probably keep on talking about in the Slack channel, uh, but also happy if someone wants to uh, share their tricks of how did they talk about FAIR or the importance of sharing data with their collaborators. Something I really uh, think is striking is that when you're creating training materials and if you're providing it in a modular way, it actually makes it a lot more reusable, in my opinion, also interoperable. So people can basically use it as Lego, just take a piece from one training material and piece of another training material in order to create something new. And then interoperability is also important to make sure that all the stakeholders of your research or project uh, are involved. So if you're making sure that something that you've written can be used by funders or that can be used by your student or it can be used by your institute, you need to make sure that it is uh, meeting different requirements. So I, I think the interoperability aspect really requires you to think about um, the needs that every people have quite differently. So someone has written, sometimes it feels like it can be hard to justify good practices if others aren't bought in, but uh, everyone likes using a resource that used good practice when it was created. So yeah, it's a very good observation. Do you want to emphasize a bit on that? Is there like a personal story behind it? This was actually me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but I was reading, I think it was actually Batul's comment about being in a new job and worrying that people weren't know, knowing it or using it, using fair data. And I was just thinking it, it is so hard to get that buy-in institutionally. Um, and sometimes it's, it's good to just be sneaky and do it anyway, because no one will complain if they use a good resource ever. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I think um, I'm sure the checklists for different principle exists if you're building a material, building a software. So I'm going to just hand it to uh, Emmy uh, so that we can hear from Neil and uh, I'm sure he's going to cover some of these aspects there. Thank you very much, Malvika, and everyone for your reflections as well. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure of welcoming Neil to our call uh, to talk about fair software. Neil, um, over to you when you're ready. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen whilst we're getting started. So uh, yes, thank you as well to the two um, previous speakers who've really set the scene on FAIR for different types of research objects and outputs. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is FAIR software, and in particular, what kind of good enough practices for FAIR software might be. Um, and hopefully, I've now shared the right part of my screen. And look. Um, can everyone see slides? Getting some nods. Um, excellent. Uh, so my name is Neil Chu Hong. I'm director of something called the Software Sustainability Institute, and I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and I'm also involved in a group uh, which is developing fair principles for software. Um, so this is part of the Research Software Alliance, the Research Data Alliance, and the Force 11 groups. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about what fair means in the uh, context of software and then giving you some possible advice to follow on how you can make your software fair. Uh, one of the things we've noticed in this last year is that lack of access to different things, to data, uh, to people, to resources, makes research more difficult. But this is something that's been going on for a long time. I, I often use this quote from the creator of a piece of software called Pymo, because it's way back in the early 2000s, uh, he was talking about the challenges to 
effective research because of the lack of access to software. Uh, and he was one of the pioneers of, of uh, research software being open and transparent and reusable, are all of the things which are uh, the principles of FAIR. And the other thing is that increasingly the research community relies on software. So we did some work at the Software Sustainability Institute now, um, oh, seven years ago, it's, it's crazy to think it's seven years ago now, where we were polling people to find out how much software affected their work. And I think the key thing that uh, came up for us is that even back then, there was about 70% of researchers who said it wouldn't be practical to conduct their work without using software. So software is everywhere. Um, it's everywhere in each part of the research life cycle, from the software you use to start planning your experiments or your research or to generate ideas for research, collecting and capturing different information from um, data from experiments, but also things like references and other reading material, organizing and storing it, backing it up, interpreting and analyzing it, um, publishing it, and making sure that it is available to, for others to discover and reuse. So software is everywhere, but it's often not treated in the same way as other types of research output. Um, and that's, that's interesting because the FAIR principles are not just for data. In the original FAIR guiding principles paper, uh, there's this line that says all scholarly digital research objects from data and analytic pipelines um, to benefit from the application of the FAIR principles. So what they're saying is that FAIR is, is important because you need to be able to have trust in the research process. You need to be able to ensure that there's transparency, reproducibility, and reusability. So how does software fit into this? The challenge is that software is not just data. Um, so if you look at it from a purely theoretic point of view, software is just a specialist subset of data. But in practice, the way that it's used means it, it needs to be treated differently from data and the FAIR principles applied in a slightly different way. Uh, so there's some things that are similar. Uh, both data and software are not commonly cited. You can Id assign identifiers like DOIs to both of them. Uh, you often have multiple versions that exist that might be incrementally changing or they might be very different. And the reuse of both software and data is typically controlled through licenses. There are some things which are at one level quite similar, uh, but when you look at the details are a bit different. So the way that you build on software and data and link them together, um, obviously we do that with both software and data, but quite often it's different. So software uh, tends to be in the middle of the, of the sort of tree of a research workflow, uh, whereas data tends to be at the edges of it. Um, in both cases, it may depend on hardware and, and software. So um, the data that's generated might be dependent on the sensors, for instance, or the um, experimental machinery. And likewise, the software may depend on the machines that you're working on. And in many cases, it's replaced by newer alternatives. So the evolution of both software and data means that, uh, except in particular fields, you'll always have new things coming along with similar or better functionality that can be swapped into um, the work they do. But there are also a number of differences that are important when we consider FAIR for software. And the key ones are that software typically has a larger number and more complex set of dependencies. So the way that it changes over time is more dramatic you'll find that software uh, is, isn't reusable um, much faster. Uh, and also that the reuse might come in a lot of different flavors. So when we think of reuse of data, we're typically thinking of the same way that uh, another person would have used the data in the past. Um, the only difference might be if it's being used in uh, a different field or for a different problem. It's still being used in the same way generally. Whereas for software, we might be thinking about rerunning or, or executing the software. We might be thinking of reading it to understand um, the decisions and the design decisions in the software. We might be using it to reproduce uh, 
an experiment, or we might be reusing it through extending or deriving something from it. So reuse for software is a much wider set of options than for data in general. Um, and it can also be connected via workflows. Uh, and there we have challenges for FAIR because um, the FAIR data principles, although they talk about interoperability, um, they talk mostly around interoperability of formats, whereas for software, we're also talking about interoperability of APIs and interoperability of semantic understanding as well. So, how has this evolved? Um, the FAIR guiding principles were developed and finally published in 2016. And over the last few years, the community has been exploring what it means to make software FAIR. So we've had a number of different workshops run by different groups, including some of the people um, who are attending this call, looking at how FAIR might be applied to software. And this has resulted in, in a number of different things. Um, in 2020, there were a large number of different resources published where the community was putting down its thoughts about how uh, FAIR should be applied to software, including um, a paper called Towards FAIR Principles for Research Software, uh, but also um, tools uh, that some of which I'll reference later on about how you might see how fair your software is um, and understanding this, uh, the way that fair is used in practice for software. And so this has led to the establishment of the Fair for Research Software Working Group, which I'm a co-chair of. Uh, and at this moment, in fact, we have the second last of our drafting meetings tonight. Um, we are looking at drafting a new set of fair principles for research software, which will be going into community consultation. So the way forward after this is the publishing of these principles and getting community feedback and, and approval on them. But then it's going onwards to understanding all the other things that happen once you have uh, the FAIR principles. So how does that feed into things like indicators and metrics, into career profiles and reward structures, um, making it machine readable in output management plans, and ultimately changing policy to ensure that research is more transparent, reproducible, and reusable. Um, so uh, this is this is kind of like all background information, but you're probably interested in knowing what you can actually do right now. Uh, so I'm just going to finish off with um, one slide on what I think is good enough practices for fair software whilst you're waiting on us to finish off the principles. Uh, so to make your software findable, make sure it's uh, easy to discover by using descriptive metadata. So things like uh, making sure that it's got a descriptive title, uh, making sure that people can understand who the authors are, uh, providing keywords. Publish a citation for your software so people know how they should credit you and add it to a community registry if one exists. Uh, and I'll admit that that's one area that uh, a lot of communities don't have a community registry yet. To make it accessible, Put your source code in a code repository. Um, so something like GitHub is a good choice there. And then deposit major versions in a preservation repository. So if you're publishing something that you expect to be shared with someone else, or it's in relation to a paper, make sure it's going into your institution's digital repository or into something like Zenodo or Figshare to get a DOI. Make it interoperable by making sure you describe the functionality of your software use open data formats that meet domain relevant community standards, provide references to other um, research objects like papers and the data sets that you're using, and modularize your code and document design so people understand how they uh, can connect it to other things. And finally, to make your software reusable, choose a license and apply it to your software. There's nothing worse than a piece of software where people can't understand how to reuse it document the dependencies that's required, and ensure that others can understand and execute your code. And I often think the best way of doing that last thing is just give it to one of your colleagues or friends to try and rerun. If they can't rerun it, and that might be either by building the source code or by running um, the executable or by using the binder or Docker container, then go back and have a look at it because it probably means that you won't remember how to reuse it in six months time either. So these are all what I would consider good enough practices for research software. 
And I think the key thing here is I've, I'm a pragmatic implementer of FAIR principles. I think it's all about making sure that you're doing things better and incrementally getting better. So I would say if you can do any of these things, uh, then you're on the road towards FAIR software. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in FAIR for research software, I put some information in the slides and you can find out more. Uh, and I've also put in some further reading in the notes uh, and of this call. So if you want to find out more, um, you can have a look at those. And if there's time, I'm happy to answer some questions or answer them in the uh, document. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, folks, again, if you have questions for Neil, of course, please put them in the Google Doc or um, on the top half of page 12 or put them in the Zoom chat. Um, Yo has a comment about, yeah, absolutely agree with what you said, Neil, about making sure you're doing things better um, and incrementally getting better, definitely. Um, just waiting for, to see if there are questions coming through. Sarah says plus a million. <laughs> um, I see Fabian's question. Um, are there counterparts to, I guess, the Software Sustainability Group in the US? Um, yes, so there's something called the US Research Software Sustainability Institute, which uh, went through a, a conceptualization phase, which is the sort of the funder, um, the funder sort of um, way of saying they're, they're trying to work out what's required in the US. Um, if you're interested in that, I would get in contact with um, Karthik Ram or Dan Katz, who are on the leadership team there. Uh, I believe that the um, the URL is like erc.us, but I'm I'm remembering this off the top of my head. I can I can put that into the notes. Thank you. Um, yeah, the link would be really helpful. Um, just leaving the awkward silence for folks to put more questions. <laughs> I see in in one of the open Q and A time as well. Someone's mentioned fair for machine learning, which might be like a subset, and I I think. I've not been involved in that work, but uh, at the Research Data Alliance, there's there's a group that's starting up looking at um, FAIR for ML as well, I think. Um, and there's also, if you are uh, in social sciences, there's some work looking at uh, FAIR for software, looking more at the curation aspects as well. So um, I think one of the key things here is that all of the different FAIR initiatives are overlapping and how you how you ensure that you you are being fair might be better thought of as as a project level rather than just that the individual types of object thank you um yeah folks if you know of any sort of initiatives i uh, see another uh, little question from from fabian as well uh, which country is really leading the fair game oh <laughs> this is this is like choosing choosing favorites isn't it um uh, I, I don't know. Uh, my, my perception um, from the outside is that the Netherlands is doing this really well. Um, so uh, I, I would say that um, what they're doing is, is really good, um, particularly um, organizations like TU Delft and the library there have been leading a lot of things. But uh, there are lots of individual initiatives. I, I, I think if you look through the resources that people have provided, you'll see similar names coming up. Uh, again and again, uh, and those are the people who are, are really leading the way rather than um, at, a, at a countrywide level. However, there are some countries which seem to be doing better at starting to implement this in policy. And so the Netherlands has been championing open science for a while uh, in a way that I haven't seen so many other countries do. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so so maybe we we could have uh, if you if you if anyone wants to follow up on that and like the Dutch development on this, of course you can ask on Slack. Happy to link you with the right people. Um, I, I'm I'm just really curious. I'm going to steal another two minutes here. Um, Neil, following up on the previous question that was asked of Emma, what do you think about sort of the divide in the understanding of or the pursuit of fair between the global south and north in the software uh, sense? Yeah, it, it's coming up as well in some of the conversations we've been having with drafting. And I, 
I think one of the key things that's coming up is in the different way that people look at how you interpret the intent of the principles. Um, and I think accessibility and, and interoperability are the key ones where people may have disagreements about how we interpret them. Um, I think there were some really good points raised earlier about accessibility and what that means. Um, and so I think I, I might categorize it as seeing that a lot of the global north um, seems to look at it in terms of technical accessibility uh, rather than in terms of broader accessibility, even though when you look at it more from a software engineering uh, perspective, uh, accessibility is, is really not just about protocols and, and how you're choosing to download something. It's about how you make uh, your work usable by the largest number of people. So, so I think there is, there is a challenge here in that the data principles perhaps did not delve into that aspect of accessibility, whereas for training, for documentation, for um, software, already in those communities, accessibility means a very different thing. Thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you very much for, for the talk and for joining us today as well. Uh, so with that, um, we have a breakout room next. Um, I'll pass to you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Emmy, for facilitating that and to all of our amazing uh, speakers who've been introducing the different topics about FAIR. Uh, so now that we've had the chance to listen to some really great viewpoints and explanations about what FAIR can mean in different areas and in different countries and in different institutions, um, we are going to go back to our reflection exercise. Um, so you, we spent a bit of time earlier thinking about how we could change fairness in our day-to-day um, -day activities um, and in our projects. Uh, but we're going to go to a breakout room this time instead, uh, so that we can actually share these discussions and thoughts with others, which may help us gain additional perspectives. Um, so huge thanks to everyone who's um, added the W's and S's to your names. I have sorted you all into breakout groups. Um, so if you look at page 12, 13 onwards of the um, of the shared, do shared document, the shared notes, then you can see the prompt that we have for discussion, which is effectively, um, like I mentioned earlier, thinking about how you can apply FAIR, um, one or more of these principles and discussing them in a group. So we have between three and four people per group, which means that each person gets around about three minutes to, to present their thoughts and then to have some feedback from other people. Um, this also, we have, I think five, four breakout rooms that are spoke uh, that are written and some that are spoken as well. So breakout rooms one, two, seven, and ten are written rooms. Um, please do just check the name of your room when you are broken out. It will show at the top of your Zoom screen whether you're a spoken or a written room, but this should hopefully match the preferences that you've all indicated. Um, and you will get about twelve minutes to discuss this each. Um, if at any point you need any help please use the ask for help button at the bottom of your screens in the breakout rooms, or you can also just come back to the main room. Um, one, oh yeah, for the written rooms, just make sure to, to agree in the Slack or in the Google Doc how you're going to communicate, but we do have very um, specific instructions in the guidance document for how to go ahead with the written breakout rooms. Any questions before we head into the rooms or is the task all clear? Thumbs up, it would be great if, we have, if we're good. Yeah, I have some thumbs. Okay, right. I know a couple of people are dropping. So there is a minor chance that I will yank you out of your room and reshuffle if anyone else is left alone in their rooms just while we're figuring things out. But I'm going to open up the rooms now and you will have 12 minutes. See you again soon. I thought it was Malvika doing the workout. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you had some nice discussions in your breakout rooms. Um, I will ask uh, if any of one, we, we have just a few minutes uh, before the end of the call. Uh, it would be nice if one of the two breakout rooms uh, shared their, their, some of their discussion that they had in their rooms. So does any one of you want to verbalize uh, what happened during the in their rooms? 
Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and to share that. Um, or if you have any questions also that happened during the in your discussion. No one want to share? Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay, Maya. Um thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was very interesting uh, breakout room because we were with Neil in the room. And um, maybe he can also add, but for, for me, the most, let's say, the greatest um, reflections were around uh, observing how particular scientific field uh, already uses or views the practices and thinking of the very small steps that each of us can do. And um, for example, for myself, I, I realized I can put some of my data sets that were not published online. And Neil mentioned that uh, it's, they do publish talks and presentations and it's also um, very, small but very useful step that for example I am planning also to implement in the future so very interesting. and Michal also uh, told us uh, about his neural imaging uh, project and shared some um, ways in, in which they try to prevent personal identification and uh, Knowledge that a lot of things are preventable, but many of them are really uh, difficult to do. Even maybe like building a, a repositories. I hope I um, delivered the message correctly. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone wants to share from mm -hmm. what happened with their discussions in their breakout rooms? Otherwise, I see that there is a lot of, of things already written in the document, so you can go through that document and see what the others uh, discuss about. I saw some nice discussions uh, or some, some nice notes that were added. Um, thanks a lot. Um, and then it's already almost the time uh, for the end of this call. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, nice talk and these nice discussions. Thanks a lot again to the speakers for delivering these nice, these nice talks. It was really great, nice to, to get your input there. Um, and I recommend you all that attended everybody to think again about um, and about that, about this FAIR principle and how they, you can apply this FAIR principle to your own project. Um, it can be okay, the OLS project, uh, but also to any other project in the future that you may have. So it would be, it's a some somehow life changing. So learning about that, it's somehow life changing. You start to think about the fair principle everywhere. I can, I mean, I'm totally biased now. I have the feeling of thinking about that all the time now. Um, I would say it's a bit the same with the things you learn about building a new project that you, what you learned during this uh, open life science things about contributing about things. You always think about that later when you start a new project. So, and the fair is also one aspect. Um, yeah, okay, I should stop talking about that, but say you have, um, thanks everybody for sharing you the, the, the different links to the different resources that you know or you heard about so you have we uh, you added a lot of things of nice links in the in the notes and I thanks a lot for for that um, thanks a lot for for yeah for the speakers for this for for putting the slide also available uh, giving the slide available so you can check them later and find other resources interesting. Um, so the next week will be, um, there will be an open office hour. Um, I think it's at, if I'm correct, I think it's at the end of the afternoon uh, European time. Um, so it's a half an hour just to catch up if you want to have, or if you have any questions, you can join there. 
And the next court call will be in two weeks. And if I'm correct, it's about uh, academia path, career path. So what are the different career paths that you can do following in regarding open science? And I see that Mavika is, is saying yes. So I didn't do this. Hopefully didn't say anything wrong. Um, and so and next week you have also probably, um, uh, you should have a meeting with your mentor then. And on that, it's already two minutes past the hours. Um, sorry for the, uh, the delay or over time. Um, please, if you have a few minutes, please tell us uh, in the feedback uh, what worked, what didn't work, what you will change, and what surprised you for about this, this court calls. And I would like to thank you all to join. Thanks, everybody, for being there for participating and making these meetings and these court calls amazing. Thanks a lot, and have a really good day, end of the day, beginning of the day, whatever is your timing, uh, your time zone. And have a nice week also. Bye. Bye-bye.